in Calvary. He said, water is life. We face the same genocide. We pray we will survive. We say we won't go quiet. We say water is life. We face the same genocide. We pray we will survive. We say we won't go quiet. No. come around again, if you feel them, you can sing them. Let's do another one from the streets. Well, the people gonna rise like the water, we're gonna cool this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great-grandmother saying, water, justice now. Oh, the people gonna rise like the water We're gonna cool this crisis down I hear the voice of my great-granddaughter Saying, keep it in the ground We say water is life We face the same genocide We pray we will survive We say we won't go fire We say water is Should we get started? All right. Sounds good. Um, well, I guess I guess it's on me to actually welcome everybody here. I forgot that. I was so taken <laughs> away by, at you. <laughs> by this wonderful, wonderful introduction that Adam, uh, Adam, yeah, I was just totally blown away, of course, as, as I always am. But um, I got the easy part here. Um, my job is just simply to say thank you for showing up at this uh, this event, this very, very important event. We have a really outstanding lineup of speakers and I want to just kind of give you a little bit of an idea of how, how, uh, how we're going to organize this, uh, <clears throat> just so you have an idea. Um, we want this to be a conversation. This is not a time for uh, long presentations and we're just gonna sit back and listen. This is an opportunity for people to talk to each other and it's a great, a great opportunity to bring revolutionaries from various uh, directions together to talk to each other. So this is, this is our goal today. Uh, way, the way it's organized is that um, Hisu and Patrick will be uh, mo uh, moderating this. Hisu is a teacher, professor at Harold Washington College, and Patrick uh, has worked in uh, the Sunrise Movement around environmental issues and also uh, among the homeless. 
So we've got uh, a great deal of experience in the moderators themselves. They're going to be asking questions to kick the, the program off. We're going to have two poetry breaks, one in the middle and one at the end. And uh, without further ado, uh, I'm very excited to introduce Patrick and Hesu to get us started today. Awesome. Thanks, Lou. It's a great intro. Thank you so much, Lou. And thank you all for joining us. Um, so with the passing of another World Water Day this past Monday, um, Lerna, Chicago, uh, we're the League of Revolutionaries for a New America um, in Chicago here. And we wanted to put together what has become an amazing lineup of revolutionaries doing their part in their communities fighting for the human right to water. As the planet continues to spiral into ecological crisis, we recognize the imbalances in the water cycle causing drought, floods, hurricanes, and mudslides can all be traced back to the ever increasing greenhouse gas, em gas emissions of now only a few transnational corporations, banks, and the politicians they control. We also recognize that the drive for profit weaponizes water in different ways. Extractive infrastructure like pipelines are fundamentally incapable of not contaminating water. Mm -hmm. And in the case of urban centers, decades of decaying infrastructure due to industrialization and the combined force of corporations and the state represented by the emergency managers have led to an unprecedented crisis in clean water access. Water is life and water is a human right. And this system of corporate private property is incapable of protecting that. And it is our duty to over our duty to overturn these forces. So today, um, let's zoom in on the uh, in and uh, let's hear from and investigate these fronts of struggle together. We're joined by um, five different um, leaders, um, and yeah, we're we're gonna zoom in on the first question, which is just to um, describe for everyone the the situation you're engaged in, the context. So we could all get roughly on the same page, um, maybe roughly five five or so minutes, and then we'll move on and, and dive into the nitty gritty. And we're gonna start with Vicki Marks from Flint, Michigan. Um, and and, and Vicki, I'll, I'll just, um, I'll in introduce you a little bit and, and give everyone a, a little bit of who you are. So Vic, Vicki is a resident of Flint for 15 years and an activist <laughs> since 2015 and is a member of the Democracy Defense League of Flint and a fighter for uh, justice and clean water. So Vicky, please take it away and, and tell us more about um, what, what, what's going on in Flint. You know, she may be having phone issues. Um, She's been coming in and out. Yeah, so. and then just we, we forgot to say just one thing. If you can mute out when other people are speaking, that, that would be great. And now we're going to keep, oh, here, she's coming back in. See if it's a stable connection. If not, we can just maybe go on to the next person until she can answer. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Ah, I'm, I'm ha having a little trouble with the, with the camera. That's okay. So we hear you loud and clear. To, to speak your truth. Uh, uh, Patrick, did you hear Patrick's question? No. Patrick, do you want to just ask it again? Yeah, Vicki. Um, so yeah, uh, if you could just start off by, um, we're going to go around and, and if you could tell us, um, you know, just the general context and the situation you're engaged in um, in Flint, Michigan. Uh, well, as we have been for almost seven years, we're still fighting to get clean, affordable water here in Flint. Um, on top of that, we're also um, fighting for justice, um, both on the legal and the um, civil side of the water crisis. Um, a lot of things that are going on all at one time make it a little tough to get together um, with the COVID restrictions, but we are still fighting. For sure. Um, and, and if you could say a little bit more, um, I mean, I think everyone here is familiar with the Flint water crisis that's been happening, like you said, for at least seven years. 
but if you could for for maybe if there's someone that that isn't as familiar if you could just give a quick um you know perhaps timeline or or backstory for um what what what's what how it started and 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 where you're at today well actually it started uh back in 2010 um when they had the emergency manager law come into being um which meant that an emergency manager could be appointed by the governor um, to take over any financial um, district in the state that's struggling. Well, they decided Flint was struggling and put us in with an emergency manager. And in April of 2014, the emergency manager, in his wisdom, uh, thought that because while we were waiting for the new KWA pipeline, which is a privatized pipeline to be built, um, that we would go off to Detroit water, which we had been on for 50 years and go to uh, the Flint River water, which the Flint River has been used for a dumping ground mm -hmm. for GM and DuPont and everything else for the last hundred so or so years. Um, so, after uh, being on um, the Flint River water for 18 months, uh, they finally listened to the residents who were saying the water wasn't safe, it was brown. Um, come to find out we had uh, high lead and copper levels. Um, we had a legionnaire outbreak, um, not to mention all the other heavy metals and bacterias and the TTHMs, which were all in the water. Um, since then, they have replaced probably all but maybe 750 uh, lead service lines in the city. However, replacing the service lines is like uh, drinking sewer water through a clean straw um, because the, the water mains, the entire infrastructure has been damaged, not to mention our interior plumbing. Um, so the new service lines are just a, a, a tap on the on the back to uh, keep us quiet. So in the meantime, we are still paying and have been for the last seven years the highest water rates in in the United States. And right now we've got. Our new attorney general dropped um, all the uh, criminal charges last June, or a year ago, June. Um, and just this January came up with more charges. Um, two are misdemeanors that were given to Governor Snyder, who was responsible for this entire mess. Um, so there are a few criminal charges going, and we're also um, fighting for a civil settlement, which the state of Michigan has kicked in $600 million. Uh, the city of Flint, McLaren Hospital, and Rowe Engineering have kicked in another $41.25 million, um, but divided between 30,000 people after the lawyers take their one third off the top, uh, doesn't leave enough to get pipes even replaced in your house, let alone for our, our medical, um, emotional, um, all that that we've been through. So we're still fighting that too. Thank you for that, uh, Vicki. And, um... So now we're, we're, we're gonna hear from um, Valerie Jean Blakely. Um, she lives on the north end of Detroit as a leader in the fight against water shutoffs and, wa and for water affordability and is an activist with Detroit People's Water Board and We the People of Detroit. Valerie, if you're, um, if you're able to um, similarly just um, lay, lay out the situation in Detroit for us um, and, and, and yeah. Um, it would be great. 
Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for uh, allowing me to be on this panel with such amazing people who do amazing work for all of us every day. Um, really grateful. And also, uh, I, I don't consider myself a leader in the work. Um, I do the work alongside of lots of people in Detroit and around the globe for water, freedom, and justice. I consider myself to be, um, you know, one of, uh, you know, a, a drop of water in, um, in an ocean of beautiful people. Um, so the situation with Detroit really kind of, um, it started in 2005, water hadn't been affordable um, for folks, P Michigan Welfare Rights um, uh, got together and, and they created, uh, got together and created the People's Water Board, which is a, a group, a coalition of grassroots um, organizations and folks. And they came up with a water affordability plan um, they got Roger Colton and a handful of some of the greatest economists and, and smartest people on the planet and came up with this water affordability plan to be implemented to um, Detroit City Council or to be given to Detroit City Council and then be made an ordinance. Um, monies were gathered at some point in time um, and they just disappeared millions of dollars towards the water affordability plan and that was promised towards the water affordability plan literally just disappeared and nobody was ever charged for it. Victor McConnell was the gentleman in charge of those monies. Um, he's on a yacht somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, we got news in 2014. I got into this work. I work on a lot of different uh, water struggles in the state of Michigan. I get to hang out with Andrea Pierce every once in a while and fight uh, line five pipeline and things like that. Um, and definitely get to hang out with the folks in Flint and uh, fight for clean, affordable water there. And I appreciate Vicki's uh, testimony. It was spot on and, and devastating to listen to, even though I already knew it. Uh, my story kind of started in 2014. Um, they shut off my entire neighborhood. We uh, started organizing. I started organizing with the People's Water Board and never stopped. Um, so they, the real, there's a lot of people are like, why, why were they shutting off? Why couldn't people afford their water? And why were they shutting off whole neighborhoods at a time? Well, the real overall reason was is very intentional. The mass water shutoffs were cut, followed with mass illegal tax foreclosures, right? They were trying to move low-income black people off of the land in the neighborhoods. You don't shut off water in whole, whole neighborhoods at one time unless you want people to leave. It's very blatant and obvious. So that was that's the main overall goal. The land was more uh, valuable without poor black people in, in communities, poor black communities um, on it. Uh, people, and since that has happened, of course, uh, large management companies and uh, Mayor Duggan's buddies and people like that have bought up huge squashes of land. There's lots of layers to that, but that's really was the overall goal, and it worked. Um, in 2014, when they shut off my neighborhood, we started organizing immediately. We started um, these uh, hubs, community hubs that would get together, and uh, mostly women, um, Black women, and we would... It, it, we would get together and if somebody's water had been shut off, we'd immediately work with DWSD or other different organizations um, to get their water turned back on or organize money or share water, uh, it immediately share water from like people next door, things like that. Um, figuring out as a community, how to respond to such an atrocity um, of somebody coming in, shutting off whole communities at one time. Um, Homrick was hired, Homrick is a demolition company uh, they were hired to do the shutoffs. And in 2014, as they were doing mass water shutoffs, they ruined the infrastructure. Um, they used a sledgehammer to shut people's water off, literally. So fast forward to today, Mayor, uh, or I'm sorry, Governor Whitmore, um, and I think it was May, decided to, May of 2020, decided that she was going to do a statewide moratorium on water shutoffs um, and that everybody had to be turned back on because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Well, the problem was, is a lot of people couldn't get turned back on because 
they, um, because they had ruined the infrastructure. <laughs> People either A, had plumbing problems inside their house that they couldn't afford to fix, um, or B, Homer had ruined their infrastructure from shutting them off and now they couldn't get turned back on. Um, so that's kind of where we are today. Mayor Duggan, this is the last thing I'll say, Mayor Duggan um, is up for re-election. He decided December, 2020, long way through the pandemic to do a two year moratorium on water shutoffs here in Detroit. Now, most would think, wow, that's great. That's wonderful. Mm. There's no infrastructure for that. At the end of that two years, people are going to have astronomical bills accumulated that they couldn't pay because of a pandemic. And they're, oh, we're going to have mass water shutoffs just like we did in 2013 and 2014. So um, it, we, it's also important to note that Mayor Duggan ignored the largest hepatitis A bra uh, breakout in the nation's history. Uh, without doing any kind of moratorium on um, water shutoffs. And he, also he um, he waited till December uh, in 2020 to pay attention to COVID because he was about to get reelected. That's where we are now. We're fighting it. Um, we have to have the water affordability plan implemented. Why this Why this moratorium is um, in place or people are, we're, we're, thousands and thousands of people are having the water shut off again. That's it. Uh, there was a real quick follow up question from Andre in the chat. She wanted to know if part of the reason they were shutting down the water was due to the um, the new bridge to Canada, because she says people were buying up land like crazy. People uh, only rich people could buy up that land. Um, I guess I haven't made that connection. I'd be interested to see or to talk to her and, okay. and see how she's making that connection, to be honest with you. Awesome, thanks Valerie. It was really just the question I was wondering because I remember seeing all, they were kept buying, all the land was going up for auction in Detroit and Delray at the same time they were doing the water shutoffs and forcing people out. So it was just a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I mean, that's, that, that's definitely the main overall goal was to force people out, force people out. All right. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yes, and, and now we'd like to um, hear from Andrea, um, Andrea Pierce um, from the fight to stop line five under the Mackinac Straits. Um, she's a member of the Little Traverse Band of Ottawa Indians and Idle No More Michigan. Um, she's fighting to stop and prevent further Enbridge oil spills. And um, if you could, Andrea, um, thank you for joining us. And if you could um, talk a little bit about the, um, the, 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 you know, the fight that you're waging against Enbridge and, um, uh, yeah, line five. All right, thank you. I'd like to start with an introduction though. Wasno de Kwe Indishnikas, Wakanaka Singo Dawa Nadao, Makwa Nadotum. I'm Andrea Pierce. I'm Little Traverse Bay Band of Nadawa Indians, and um, I'm Bear Clan, so that was what I was just saying. I want to thank everybody, say miigwech, for inviting me. I really appreciate to be included in such a an amazing um, group of presenters about something that is very dear to me, which is our water. Um, I started off, it's a really odd circle of events for me. I started off with line five. It's um, almost 70 years old. It was only supposed to last 50 years, but it's actually 68 now. And every day we risk losing 20% of our world's fresh water. Mm. And what will we do then? I've got a picture behind me here. If you see, it's got the ice, right? That's all winter long. If we have a, a spill during the winter, give it up. There's nothing they can do. They can't do it. They, they failed the spill drills in, um, in the 2000s. Oh, 2000, I think it was 18, 17 or 18. They did a spill drill, beautiful, beautiful sunny day. And they couldn't save, they couldn't stop it. So that tells you there, we're in big trouble. Um, I started off as, um, an in the streets activist. I was with a megaphone um, going all over the state of Michigan, bringing awareness to line five and the danger that's under there, that pipeline. I've, um, I've tried just about everything I can do to stop this. I've talked to legislators. We started a pipe out paddle up flotilla, which brought legislators, tribal communities, Michigan citizens, environmental organizations. If you cared about the water, we wanted to see you there. And that was over Labor Day weekend, which was one of the biggest events at Mackinac. They did the big bridge walk. They walk across that big bridge on Monday, but we held this on Saturdays. 
And we met a lot of people. We brought, reached out and it was to bring awareness. I fully believe that we're going to be stronger together and we can't win this just one person. There's no way one person can fight everything and everybody. We have to band together as groups of people. And I try to support that. If I see that you're having a protest or need somebody to show up and be a body, I don't even have to show up and talk. I'll just show up. So you can say, oh, there was hundreds of people there. That's what we need to do. If you see something going on, join in. Even if you're, if you're doing it silently, we need the numbers. And um, with line five, they're trying to um, not only keep that pipeline going, but during the seven or 12 years, there's no plans where we've not seen a single plan really from Enbridge, what they, how they expect to build this pipeline or what it's entailing, just horror stories about how it's gonna be wastewater coming through, destroying our fresh water, and there's no way to contain this. There's gonna be, um, there's just so much with this, a, a tunnel. You wanna dig a tunnel underneath the Straits of Mackinac. And over the summer, I was part of a group of people that have found out there's a 10,000 year old cultural site underneath, along the bed of native where native americans had hunted or prayed we still haven't um, totally figured out what this is but it's ten thousand years old and we cannot risk losing that historical landmark now to uh the destruction of a tunnel going underneath to provide minuscule amounts of oil and tar sands and to go that goes to, through detroit all the way it goes all the way down i don't know if you can see michigan's a big hand guys <laughs> But it goes all the way down to Detroit and goes across to Canada. And Canada sells that. And we found out most of that gets sold um, to China. They export that to China. And what are they doing with this, this oil and that they pump? They make plastic out of it. Yes. Plastic. Is that what we really want to ruin our fresh water for is so that we can have plastic? Not me. And I have done everything that I, I think I possibly can. And every time I say that, something new comes up. Because now I've started a, um, a caucus in the Democratic Party since we are bring, bringing legislators who work on making this against the law. All of this should be illegal. We should not be able to have a Canadian corporation come into our state and buy out our government, which is what I, in my opinion, is a lot of ways happening. Our, they have, um, we, we get county commissioners. We do all of this to elect county commissioners. We talk to them. We get them our ideas. We tell them what we think. They get elected. They go to a training sponsored by Enbridge for a week with our county commissioners. I don't even get to talk to my county commissioner for a week. Why is Enbridge sponsoring this and talking to them? And what do you think they're discussing? Pipelines and tunnels. Exactly. They had a crappy resolution that went around and discusses, and it goes through, Enbridge released it and talks about how great and wonderful and how much we need a tunnel. And it's being passed. Why? Because they bought our, our government in a lot of different ways. Mackinac City has stated they can't afford to, to finance their own city without Enbridge money. And that's where we're coming into, that money that is going to end up destroying everything that we love in Michigan, our beautiful waters. How are we going to be the Great Lakes state if all we have is pipelines and, and, and oil spills? Kalamazoo was one of the largest ones. That's in Michigan. So why are we letting another the same company do the same thing under the the Great Lakes. It makes no sense to me. So yeah, we started a caucus now because I was I fell down a lot, got hurt, and couldn't do the streets. What the um, protesting in the streets? My daughter told me I can't protest in the streets until I can outrun the police again. So I'm working on it. <laughs> but um, we got this caucus going, and we're trying to make a lot of things. We're trying to pass laws. We're trying to get better candidates running, more people. If we get Native American people running for um, the environment, if we get environmental people running to protect the environment, we can change a lot of things. I'm finding out that we weren't at the table, and there's a big reason why. After Standing Rock, I found out the GOP and the Republicans were really worried that the Natives would show up at their places and change things. They would show up at the legislative offices. They would show up to um, support and pay for bills and introduce bills and talk about bills. And we didn't show up. And this is what's happening. Now they just, oh, they're not here. Well, we can get what we want. And they do. They don't consider us at all. They don't consider our needs. All they're worried about is them and their money. So if we wanna change things, we need to show up everywhere. And that's just how I feel about it. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, and I, I'd love to, uh, in a little bit, dig more into into that um, struggle in Michigan. Um, but first, then let's let's just go through the rest of our speakers here. We have um, next up my friend Kaylee uh, Kafura from Chicago, um, a direct action organizer with Rising Tide Chicago, um, conflict palm oil activist, and activist against extractive industries polluting waters. Um, Kaylee, I know you're. Um, involved with um, a lot right now, um, especially the uh, escalating fight against line five, another Enbridge pipeline. So if you could um, help us a, a little bit understand more about the context with that struggle. Ah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kaylee. I use she, her pronouns. I'm on uh, stolen Odawa, Ojibwe and Potawatomi land here in Chicago. Um, like Patrick said, I'm a direct action organizer with Rising Tide Chicago. We um, we do a lot of work around uh, kind of solidarity actions with, uh, you know, a lot of work against Enbridge right there with you, Andrea. Um, and Enbridge has been kind of our main focus here in Chicago because um, we've been thrown down uh, in solidarity around like banks that are financing these pipelines. Um, but we've been focusing on line three because of the way that it's been escalated kind of um, to the forefront. Um, and I'm here to share kind of the line three story as an accomplice um, in solidarity with frontline water protectors. I'm obviously not like the uh, spokesperson, but as an accomplice, I just kind of want to give you that that background of what's been happening. Um, because what's been happening in so-called Minnesota right now is like the moment that tribal nations and community and environmental groups have been resisting for seven years. Um, so Enbridge has been wanting to build the new line three carrying toxic tar sands oil for nearly a decade, but the brilliant resistance to this project has basically delayed the construction until uh, November of last year. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people think that this is like they're taking out the old line three and replacing it with a brand new pipeline to make it safer, but they're leaving in the old line three pipeline. Uh, they're doubling the amount of oil and then they're building a new pipeline corridor. Um, so if any of y'all have been fo following the fight up there um, with like the new collective and honor the earth, they're showing like the destruction that's happening and like the, the forests that are being taken down to build this new pipeline corridor. Um, and it's going to bring nearly a million barrels of tar sands per day from Alberta, Canada, where the tar sands field is uh, down to Superior, Wisconsin. And tar sands is one of the dirtiest fossil fuels on earth, um, extremely carcinogenic, uh, just something that of all the oils should really be left in the ground. This one is the worst. Um, and this path of construction will actually be crossing 200 bodies of water, including the Mississippi River twice. So it's really horrifying, uh, the path that it's taking. And, and Bridge loves to like, uh, kind of make it look as though it's a, it's a safe replacement project, right? That they're, they know their old pipeline is, uh, you know, ancient, needs to be retired, but they're, they're not taking out of the ground. They're building an entirely new one. So it's really like a lot of uh, greenwashing, I guess, in a way that they're like, you know, protecting us by building a safer, newer pipeline. Um, and water protectors have been putting their bodies on the line consistently nearly every single week since November when they finally got all the permits to start building. Um, and they're continuing to throw down uh, to protect the water despite really intense escalation from both pipeline workers and cops. Um, and a lot of you may know that there's increased um, sex and drug trafficking that comes around these extractive projects. Uh, the biggest um, piece that folks should be aware of is the missing and murdered indigenous relatives that happen around these pipeline projects and also where the parts are extracted. Um, the, there's just a direct correlation from the man camps that are built uh, to house pipeline workers and then those increased um, missing and murdered indigenous relatives. Um, so it's both water and the direct impact to the indigenous communities uh, because these are built in often rural areas and uh, nearby uh, reservations and indigenous land. Um, and it directly threatens our Great Lakes region here um, in Chicago. So we, we like to, as Rising Tide kind of connects the way that although Line 3 is like hours away from us, um, it's actually right near us where it gets refined. So Lime 3's tar sands oil comes down to the BP refinery in Whiting, Indiana, which is right on the coast of Lake Michigan, um, just directly like polluting the lake right there. Um, and then the whole community surrounding that 
refinery is just breathing in the like toxic byproduct that is uh, coming out of that tar sands. So it's it's as a as a collective, our collective rising tide, we we do try to make these connections of um, you know the bigger Great Lakes picture because yes, it's going through the Mississippi, but it's also coming down right into our backyards as well, um, and and directly affecting Lake Michigan. And we also tie that into the Line Five fight, right? Because this is all Enbridge, and these are all pipelines carrying oil. Um, and we try to confront those root causes of these projects um, that exacerbate climate change and violate indigenous sovereignty. And these root causes are capitalism, white supremacy and colonialism. And we need to name those when we do this work uh, here in Chicago, because um, those are the things that are perpetuating these projects to keep happening and to keep um, violating all of these human rights, right, and our, and our water. Um, so we've taken direct action locally at banks, as I said before, and at the refinery in BP, uh, in Whiting, Indiana, um, and, you know, demonstrating the environmental racism that's like so blatant, you know, they, they purposely do not build these pipelines, like going through, you know, suburban white communities. Um, we saw that happening in Standing Rock and how the original route was supposed to be through or near Bismarck, but, um, obviously it got redirected. So we seek to demonstrate how those are all connected, the struggles and um, how our position in the Great Lakes kind of connects the pipeline fight to the narrative that water is life. And it's all connected to our freshwater sources here. So just a quick rundown on the line three situation and folks are still throwing down like nearly every single day up there. It's really incredible. So thanks y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Yeah. Um... And um, if, 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 if anyone has, I'm just going to plug that struggle, like if anyone um, wants to visit the, you know, social media and website of those organizations Kaylee mentioned to, to support um, that struggle or even go up there themselves, I believe there is a, a call out for as many bodies as possible to as many people to come and witness and prevent further destruction um, up in Minnesota. Um, so thank you, Kaylee. Um, Right on. And now we're going to um, we're going to hear from Rukia Lumumba um, from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, uh, Rukia is ma manages the mayoral reelection campaign for her brother, Chakwe Antar Lumumba, um, where the storm damage um, of the last month has forced people to boil their water for more than a month. Um, she is the co leader of the uh, Electoral Justice Project for the movement for Black Lives and a member of the Malcolm X grassroots movement. Um, so I'm very honored, we're very honored, Rakia, if you could, um, that you're here and, and if you could just tell us a little bit about the, um, the, the crisis right now in Jackson and the, its context and, and, and maybe the whole context of Mississippi in general. Yeah, hey, can y'all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, I've learned a lot and taken a lot of notes um, from all around what's happening and, and so really appreciate it. We are newer to um, water work, so let me be honest, um, water justice. We have been, uh, one of the other things I'll mention though is that also I'm the executive director of a local organization, the People's Advocacy Institute, which is where I do most of my work. Um, and so our efforts to reelect my brother and things like that are our acts of, of activism and not of, um, of, of career, I guess, or job. And so my real work is, is building community capacity with our People's Advocacy Institute. And so, um, and so um, we have been, I'll try to be brief. I'm gonna really try my best. Um, but we have been experiencing water woes um, since uh, the 90s. Um, is the earliest I think most of us, at least around my age, can remember. Um, uh, we have uh, infrastructure, water infrastructure uh, problem that has existed for several decades. Um, our pipes are significantly old, um, over 100 years in the city. Most of the pipes are over 100 years old. Um, we saw a, a divestment of funds and funding into the city of Jackson when black leadership took over in 1997. Um, and since 1997, we have consistently just seen a decrease in funding happening, not only for our water infrastructure, which includes our sewage maintenance, includes 
um, of course, the piping, but also includes roads that are, are consistently deteriorating because the pipes are constantly bursting um, and different things like that. And all of the economic challenges that come to residents as a result of that, to folks, to community members as a result of that, right? Um, so about our health, as well as just about our ability to even earn a living. Um, one of the examples that we talk about is how every time you hit a pothole, which are, which are pretty uh, common here, um, when you hit a pothole in the road, uh, it bursts your tire and your rim and the cost that it takes to get that fixed and how that then impacts your ability to get to work and how that impacts your financial ability to pay your rent or pay any other bills when you're already on a fixed income. Um, and most of those road um, uh, bumps, as, as if I, I'll call it, are caused by our poor infrastructure underneath the ground, which includes our pipes. And so one, we have that. But then there's this other part of just how healthy is our water. And so we have been under EPA um, kind of consent decree for years. I don't know the exact amount of years, um, but EPA has been... Um, uh, following our water uh, cleaning process and the like for at least, I know, for the past eight years for sure. I'm sure that it was, has been longer than that. Um, but the additional thing is that we have boil water notices all the time, right? Um, for many different reasons, sometimes for lead, sometimes for other contaminants. And so uh, recently, we had the winter storm crisis. And during our winter storm, um, which really speaks to our need to really begin to prepare uh, for disaster, you know, that are going to keep happening in our communities over and over and over again. And water is a critical aspect there. And so during our winter storm um, that we experienced on February 4th, uh, February 13th um, and continued for a week, uh, we, uh, our pipes froze, many of the pipes froze. Our roads were literally frozen, covered with ice as if it was an ice skating ring. You couldn't tell the road from the grass, from anything. It just looked like all a huge, large uh, sheet of ice, like what we see behind you. Andrea. Um, and so um, uh, with a little layer of snow underneath, you know, when we first happened on, on February 13th, when, the, when it first fell that evening on February 14th, people, we all started to go outside because we were excited. We don't get that weather here, right? Most people don't even own a coat in Jackson, Mississippi. And so when we went outside, you know, we, uh, my son and I, you know, he, he went out and he put his hand into what we thought was snow and then found it was thick, straight ice. Couldn't do anything. Couldn't even pick up the limb that was frozen solid in it. Couldn't even pull it out. It was just so thick. And then realized you couldn't even leave your garage or your driveway or anything because it was just such thick ice. So we were all iced in um, for days. I didn't realize how long we had been iced in and thus, um, I didn't realize that for um, a couple of days, I didn't realize how serious the ice den situation was until two days after the fact when people started to text and say, well, my water is off. And we started getting water alerts and energy alerts to begin to conserve our energy. Um, and so we, would, we were told to put our, our heat down as low as possible to like 60 something degrees and to have our pipes drizzle water out so that to prevent as many pipes from freezing at, at all and to fill up your bathtub if you still have water with water so that you could at least flush the toilets and things like that. So by the third day when the storm hit again, we got another rage of the storm, um, over half of the city was without water um, and um, a great number without electricity as well. And most of this happened in communities that already have been greatly divested from. Um, since 1997. So that happened in South Jackson and in West Jackson, but all throughout the city. But the, the hardest hit places were definitely South Jackson and West Jackson, which are predominantly black um, areas of town. But also South Jackson has historically been a predominantly poor area of town for all residents. And so um, it also is furthest away from our water resource center, right? And so what we saw is that 
and continue to see is that they were suffering and suffered the longest. We were without water for almost five weeks. We were without water for four weeks for sure. People did not have water in most of the city. Um, the governor did not step in until week three to finally call for a state of emergency after he was um, pushed on it publicly, finally, when we were able to get national attention in week three. Um, uh, the governor then finally called in uh, FEMA and other support to help, and the governor sent water tanks to at least fill our uh, water uh, tank system, our water well system, um, to be able to have water that could go out to some residents. Um, we are currently, uh, the boil water notice came off, um, so folks had running water um, by week four, by week, uh, the end of week four, the beginning of week five, the boil water notice came off where folks could actually drink the water again. Um, and so uh, for all of that period of time, I mean, it, we were just living and trying to take care of each other. And it was community members that were our first responders. And so oftentimes, you know, you would, I would even come home at night and, and forget to even get myself water and my family water. So I'd walk in the house and say, oh my gosh, I, I don't even have no water, right? You know, I need to go back out and get it. You didn't realize how long it had been because you were just so used to just pushing it and, and moving through it. But, um, you know, it was a great community effort. We got a lot of support from um, the Movement for Black Lives, from um, Smile Trust, um, the, the brilliance of a Black woman, Valencia Gunder, who has been doing climate justice work um, in, in predominantly Florida, but throughout the nation, who helped us really began to organize wellness checks so that we could call and see who uh, was in need. So we would call, we called nearly 10,000 people, um, closer actually, I think we got closer to 8,000 people. We called about 8,000 people um, across the city of Jackson and rural communities. What I didn't mention is our rural communities were also impacted. And so while Jackson was hit hard, our rural communities were also hit and they were also without water um, for three weeks. Um, their water was able to be restored faster because they are smaller spots, but they still were suffering and the governor still did nothing, right? And these are predominantly black and brown and indigenous communities. And I should have started and I apologize and, and thank you, Andrea Pierce for your um, example, but I do want to acknowledge that the land that we're on is Natchez, it's between Natchez and Choctaw land. And so the Natchez people have been completely wiped out by um, this government. And, and so the Choctaw nation still um, and people still reside, but I, I like to, to make sure that I mention that. But the governor's failure was a willful and intentional act to prevent resources to hit Jackson and other predominantly black, brown, indigenous, and poor communities. It was willful and it was intentional. There was no excuse at all. And so now we see um, a push um, by some state legislators to provide Jackson and other smaller communities with some type of um, relief to help fix our water infrastructure walls. In Jackson, we have a two billion water infrastructure problem. That includes our sewer, that includes our um, uh, roads, that includes um, storm uh, repair and things like that, two billion. What we asked for last year was 47 million to help towards uh, fixing the pipes. The state legislators uh, approved it, but the governor vetoed it. What we've asked for this year is not only another 47 million to fix the immediate problem that we have as a result of the winter storm, but another 40, uh, but the uh, 47 million that we also asked for last year, right? So we need all that money. Not part of it, not some of it. We don't need the, tw we, we need more than 26 million, which uh, Cindy Hyde Smith, Senator Cindy Hyde Smith, a current conservative senator here, is saying that she's pushing through her bill. We need much more than 26 million. Jackson is the capital of Mississippi. 
It is the largest metropolitan city, period, in the state by three, right? And it is um, a place that the state has been trying to take back hold of, as we've seen in Detroit, as we've seen in Flint, as we've seen in so many other places. It's the same game that they're trying to play with us here. And they've been trying for decades to take back hold of Jackson. And one of the ways that we know capitalists try to take back hold of a place is they try to deprive it of the resources that the people need to survive and to actually govern. And so what we've seen here is that not only have they failed year after year, I should say that since 1997, every black administration that has held office has asked for support with our water infrastructure. Every single one with the exception of maybe one. I, 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 we don't know one of them, we, we can't remember. But all the others, right? We also know that just alone in, in, in the current Shokwe and Tar Lumumba administration and my father's administration prior to that, my father, the late Shokwe Lumumba, um, uh, was one of the first to, to move serious efforts using people's power to actually deal ourselves as our own first responders with our water infrastructure issues by passing a 1% sales tax that he actually didn't even believe in. But the people of Jackson said, we want this 1% sales tax. We want to contribute to our water walls. We want to get this fixed. And so he went along with it, right? Because where he was a representative of the people, he's not a dictator. And so, um, you know, pass this 1% sales tax that would have allowed um, $13 million a year to go into infrastructure repairs in the city of Jackson. Um, when that was passed, the state then tried to, to come in and take power over that by creating a commission, a 1% sales commission, where Jackson city leaders wouldn't have the complete control over determining how to use that money for infrastructure. And so we're still fighting to some extent to make sure that that money is actually used for what residents feel like it needs to be used. Um, and then I'll, I'll be quiet because I know I'm talking a lot, but um, that's where we are. We're in a, a fight right now to ensure that we get full funding for what is needed for our infrastructure repairs. We need more support and uh, assistance in ensuring that our water is clean. Um, we know what the EPA standards are, but we're not sure, right, as residents, we don't have a, 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 a strong organizing, water organizing um, crew here. Um, and so we are trying to build that now. We recognize that it's important. Um, we also know that um, the problems that we're experiencing here in Jackson with water is not uh, just a Jackson problem. It is absolutely a state problem. We know that, for example, in Canton, Mississippi, a few years back, um, there was a contamination of their water where people um, were being, um, uh, uh, began to be ill because of sickness coming from the water, from contamination from the chicken plants into the water. Um, and so uh, uh, people were coming very ill and babies being born with defects and different things like that. So we know that this is a problem and we are thankful to, to finally be a part of the conversation and hopefully have some assistance and help and helping us to develop out what does it look like to get clean free and uh, water. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. So I'm actually going to post a second question on the chat and we're going to just switch up the program a little bit. We're going to take a break after the second question and any speaker who wants to take a, a you know, take a uh, answer, please, please feel free to do so. So you've touched on this, a number of you, but how does a uh, privatization play a role in the struggles you are facing? Do you want to go ahead again, Rukia? Did you? Just up to you. Andrea, you're muted. Yeah, just wondering who was question was going to. Anybody and whoever wants to start, we're gonna just go. We don't have to go in order this time. So, did you want to speak to it, Andrea? Uh, sure. I guess I could. The privatization of our water, I think, is. Um, I read online just recently, last couple of months, that now it's, a, it's on the stock market. So that's like really the ultimate privatization of water. 
I totally believe that we should not be privatizing our water at all. It's not a commodity. This is a sacred being that we should be rever have reverence for and treating as, a, as it's sacred. Um, we are part of water. Water is a part of us. Without the water, we can't live. And it just, it just boggles my mind that everywhere I turn, I see these little bottles of water everywhere from a company that has already, Nestle, has already said that um, on their web pages that they don't do anything extra, extra to the water. They just stick it in the bottles and go. So actually what they're manufacturing is bottles, the plastic bottles, and they're stealing our water. So that's the, everywhere you turn, it seems that we are being privatized about something, but the water is especially heinous. Um, I feel that these pipelines with the tar sands and all of this going through all of our water. I mean, if you look at the maps of where it is, they like they go out of their way to hit our water. And I totally believe that if you control the water, you can control the people. Just like if you control the food, you can control the people. Those are two things that we cannot live without. So we're going to have to really step up and really work towards um, privatization and trying to change our mode of thinking. Not everything should be sold. You know, it's something should be human rights that we are entitled to, and we should be praying for that water. That water needs so much help. Um, I, it's a little bit off topic, but I always worry about the beaver. His job is to clean the water. And what are we pumping in that water and how is it affecting him? You know, we're killing the, the natural wildlife that, that needs this. And we need the beaver there to, you know, that's his job is to keep our water clean, but we're pumping such horrible stuff through it. They can't live through this. We can't live through it. How are they supposed to? And sorry, I was reading the chat. Yeah, to the hedge funds for over $3 billion. So there's another company that's going to be selling the water. They're just going to buy it all out. But we really just, I'm, a, I, I'm against all of that. I really am. I don't. I try to limit my plastics. I try to not, I don't buy water. If I go to events, I um, bring one of those big, huge orange containers full of water. Say, and I tell people don't, this is before COVID, I don't go anywhere now. But um, I put on there, you know, don't, are you, do you, did you have water? And they'll say, no, we're going to get it. Don't save that money. I'll bring the water. Um, and I bring those great big containers full of filtered water. We have filters at our house. We have PFAS here in um, Ypsilanti. We can't eat the fish. We have PFAS up north. In beautiful Upper Michigan, um, Pelston, Michigan, has um, PFAS. They say half the town has PFAS contamination, half of it doesn't, but they're on an aquifer. So well water with aquifer. So tell me how half of it's poison and half of it's not. I don't understand, and I'm asking for more testing, and they're doing more testing. It just takes a long time. In the meantime, my parents and my aunts and uncles are being contaminated by PFAS poisoning in an area that should never have had PFAS poisoning. Not, we never should have, any of us should have. So what's gonna happen there? It's just so many different levels that this privatization, and why are we putting everything right on the water? Seriously, think about that. All these, I mean, all the companies and they're dumping into our water, into it all the time. They put it right in, in like there's nothing to, to stop them. We don't have the laws is where I'm at with it. We need to build the laws. In my state, Michigan, we got Attorney General um, Dana Nussel. She ran saying that she was going to do her best to fix this. We're going to follow the letter of the law. And she, we voted her in, and she's tried. She's done everything she can, and she found out we don't have the laws to protect us. So how is that? We have a person that's willing to enforce the law. We don't have any laws to protect us. In fact, we actually have a law in Michigan that says we can't have a law higher than federal. And then federal doesn't have law. So we can't even use make laws to protect us that way. We have to change them federally and then try to get them here. You know, it's just insane. The fight that we're doing on the different levels to protect our, our water. I don't call it a resource. I call it a sacred being, I really do. Um, that cultural site we found at sacred also. And that's what we need to get back to is thinking of things as sacred and um, work with work with it. You know, we can't just be, oh, we're human, we own everything and buy and trade everything off like it's nothing. What's the big plan next, right? Are they planning on moving to, to Mars and leaving us here? That's what I've heard. Destroy everything and then move. 
That's what they did. And um, back in the olden days, back in England, they destroyed that pretty much. And then they moved here. And now here we go. How many years did it take? And I really think as a community, our communities all need to band together. We all need to work together and we all need to work on this. To stop it. This privatization, we have to put a stop to it. Hold on to our monies. Don't let them have it. You know, what little we have, use it. Use it to protect us. Um, go back to barter. That's what we've been doing with my tribal um, and tribes. We've been trying to work on more bartering. If I'm working with you on something, I would barter. I'd rather do that than take money because that feeds into their system. And now that uh, with COVID, one of the best things I saw was that so many companies and corporations are dying left and right. And I'm like, even Brooks Brother, I like cheered when Brooks Brothers had to sell off. I'm like, that's the old man suits. If they can't get their suits, we're winning this war. And that's where, <laughs> and that's where we're at, right? <laughs> we got to take our wins as we come across them. And everything at this moment is being privatized. And really, we need to stop it. We need, we have all, I went through Detroit um, Southwest at 48217218 last night. And there's just so many empty houses and that you know, they were beautiful back in their day. And there's just, they're knocked down. There's just empty lots. We should be making gardens there. Why can't we have gardens everywhere? Instead of an empty lot from somebody who's not taking care of the property, we could build beautiful gardens and feed our people. I mean, these um, corporations that are now closing up and shutting down, let's take that land back. It's ours. They ran us out. Now that they're gone, let's take it back. Let's take it and build gardens and build places where people can live. This shouldn't be like this. There's just so many different ways that if we band together, we can make changes. I really believe that. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, anybody else want to speak to this question of privatization? Um, well, well, the one thing I can mention is some of our woes is around um, Siemens. So Siemens, which is a company um, that uh, was responsible for installing our water billing and water um, meter uh, systems. Um, and then they, they had a contract for some other parts of the water infrastructure. They had a contract for uh, years in, in, Mrs. in Jackson in particular. And uh, they came and they, they reinstalled um, newer meters that were supposed to properly read how much water people were supposed to be getting um, so that bills would read accurately. What we ended up finding out is that one, they installed them improperly. And so for years, folks would get extremely high bills, including up until now, like we're still in the process of figuring that out. And when I say extremely high bills, I mean bills of like a household getting a $1,500 bill. You had some places getting $15,000 bills, right, for their water. Um, you had um, in certain parts of the city, which was ironic, it was in predominantly white areas, there were no meters installed at all, right? Um, and so for years, the joke around town was that they were quiet because they weren't paying water in the first place, right? Um, and so um, had this huge issue. And so finally last year, um, uh, our mayor, our, my brother, the mayor, uh, sued Siemens on behalf of the city because of the billing and water um, meter uh, problems. And um, one, the largest suit that a city was able to obtain, a settlement, a largest settlement that a city was able to obtain from Siemens, um, from a suit against Siemens, because Siemens had been sued by numerous other cities that they had contracts in from across the nation. Um, and so that money is um, being used to actually fix the problem as well. But it was the first time that anybody had stood up to one of those major companies and, re and, and, and he got a lot of heat from it. My brother got a lot of heat from it. Um, you know, city council didn't agree with him suing. They said, no, you shouldn't do it. Um, you know, business owners, everybody was like, no, you shouldn't do it. And he was like, no, I'm doing it. This is for the people. And so he sued and, uh, we, and, and we won. And I think that it's, a, it's about standing up for what you know is right, period. When it comes to our people, we have to be brave. We have to be courageous. We have to do the uncommon thing. We have to do the uncomfortable thing at times. And so that means that we have to push beyond the norm.
All right, thank you so much. Somebody else? And we can come back to these these um, questions and ideas. Um, so we were going to, oh, I'll just wait a little bit, sorry. This awesome. Um, we were going to have a, a poet perform, but I think uh, he left. He might be having tech issues. So do you want to continue on to the next question? I'm down. All right. And then people have been asking some questions um, privately. We're going to close out in just a little bit with the last one. Hopefully he'll come back. But Patrick, do you want to ask the third one? Absolutely. Um, so obviously this has been touched on already. But um, this third question for the for the for all of you is how how is the struggle for water for clean water access related to race and class? I definitely like to talk about that. Please, Does anybody, um, just briefly. I mean, if you look at the situation, and I already kind of touched on it a little bit. If you look at the situation in Detroit, right, it was very, very intentional to move black people out of the neighborhoods. It, the, the land was more valuable without um, low income people on it. And so that was a very intentional thing that had been in place for years. They had to sell a whole narrative that the people living in the neighborhoods didn't want to pay their you know, would prefer cable to, they'd pay their cable bill, but they wouldn't pay their water bill, right? That narrative, um, they're having a bunch of children, they're lazy, they're fat, they don't care about their children, right? Those people. So there was, we were years before and the narrative was already being sold by a whole bunch of different ways, a you know, to the point where people thought that they could just you know, they didn't have to worry about Detroit too much. They can roll down Woodward. They can come in on Woodward and scroll all the way down to downtown and not give any worries about being in those neighborhoods whatsoever. They thought it was you. Who cares about those people? When they started the mass water shutoffs, those people, they were, it, was, it had already been, the narrative had already been told. It was already in everybody's mind. Those people don't matter. They don't pay their bills anyway. They're going to pay their cable bill first. When they get some money, they're going to buy a big screen TV or some shoes. So it was very intentional here um, to move people out, but also to kind of squash some of the diversity in our neighborhoods, right? We have um, folks from all over the world We're in those neighborhoods, um, very, very intentional uh, for, to move those people out. And I just, I, I think that that's important to be, yeah, to be said. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, thank you, Valerie, if y'all don't mind. Um, Go for it. My, yeah, thank you, Valerie, for that, because it's so real. Um, you know, one thing I just, like, one of my just, like, thoughts as you were talking was just like, <laughs> Like, who cares what people are going to use their money for? It's their money to use. And water is a human right, right? Like, we should have water, period. Nobody should be paying for it in the first place. And the fact that we have to pay for it is problematic in itself. So, That's right. you know, so, like, it, it just, it, it's just ridiculous. I think, you know, this, um, this, this capitalistic system, they try to play us in one, in a couple of ways. One, either by pushing us out and or by just depriving us, right? And so we, we're we experiencing the latter here in Jackson. I mean, they literally just try to deprive us of every resource that we have. They've tried to take our school district, which is the second largest district in the state. They're trying to take our airport board. I mean, our airport, um, which is the only major airport in the state. Um, and, and, and they, for decades, uh, failed to provide us with the resources we need around our infrastructure. And so I know that many of you all on the call have had the same thing happen. And it is because we are predominantly black city. Jackson is 88% black, um, a little less than that. I think now it's about 85% black. Um, and we have been under black leadership since 1997. 
we know that it is a direct correlation. There is no, no, <laughs> no question about that at all. Thank you so much. Kaylee, or somebody else want to take a? Yeah, I could um, just talk briefly. I think like it's uh, around pipelines in general. Um, as I was talking about earlier, they're intentionally, I mean, with a lot of extraction projects, you see this all over the country. Um, they're When they're built, they're intentionally put through certain neighborhoods, right? Uh, we see environmental racism being very, very blatant, um, specifically like with line three, how the first route went through, um, like basically right through the reservation, the White Earth Reservation, um, and through the White uh, the wild rice beds that are up there and are found nowhere else in the world um, and are sacred to the lifeways of the Anishinaabe people up there. So I think that that's something that is really interesting is like the, that when these projects are designed, um, it's directly impacting uh, these indigenous communities. And in uh, Alberta, Canada, we see the First Nations being affected up there by the tar sands mine um, and how basically uh, the entire region has been dredged up to extract this tar sands oil. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's very intentional, it's very blatant. And then that's just the building of the projects, right? Then when you see the resistance from water protectors to these projects on the ground, uh, you see um, black and indigenous water protectors being treated so much differently, as we all know, by the cops and by the pipeline workers um, versus, you know, someone like me going into the front lines. Like that is just a very like race and class is very much like very visible, undeniable. Um, we saw that happening at Standing Rock as well um, when folks were arrested like there are still water protectors in jail who were um, trying to stop DAPL. Um, and we will probably see that with line three, which is really horrifying and super scary to think of. So like it, you know, it puts people like me, myself in a position to like weaponize my privilege, right? And to use that on the front lines because I will be treated differently and the repercussions will be not as harmful to me as it would be to some communities. Um, but at the same time, this also isn't like directly impacting my life either. Like this pipeline is directly like genocide for these communities in uh, Northern Minnesota. And so I think it's just very interesting to see that dynamic play out and like how it's almost come to a point where they don't even try to disguise it anymore. Like they don't even try to humane or greenwash uh, these projects. Enbridge is just like, this is who we are. Um, and this is what we've been doing. Every pipeline, line three, line five, every single one is like intentionally going through these communities. And um, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to watch because it's like they don't even have shame around it. Um, so yeah, just the way the cops are in cahoots with like the pipeline companies and how they target certain people differently um, as you all have probably witnessed. And um, it just plays out on like such an obvious scale. That's really, really sickening. So that's just kind of my piece on line three. Sure, awesome. Thank you so much. So we're just gonna ask one, one final question and then open it up. And uh, we have Steve, Lisa and Jim. I know your name's not Lisa, but on stack. Uh, but we just have one question to talk about um, how, how do you see the struggle around water related to other struggles like housing, um, education, healthcare? How do you see the interconnection? I think it's just another tool to keep us fighting. I really do. I think um, get us fighting over the water, get us fighting over the food, get us fighting over housing, healthcare, education. We can't fight everything at the same time. And it just weighs us down. And we're trying, you know, can't, most people have to work two or three jobs and that takes another one, it takes time. Um, how are you gonna fight if you can't put food on your table? How are you gonna fight if you can't pay, forge your water bills? You gotta go to work, you gotta stay home, you can't do it. And I think that those that can need to step up and really work. I mean, it's just making us doing a lot of fear tactics to make us scared so that we stay home and stay on their own little tracks. And, I, and it's all about the slavery of America is where I'm at with it. They are trying to get us to where we can't do anything but go work for them. That's where we're at. They want us un, under their thumb. They, it started in 1492 when they first got here and was genocide and killing our people for the land and for our um, our water and our land back then and our, our everything. It started back then and it has not stopped. They um, they brought people over here from another country because they didn't want to work. They 
can't, they tried to kill us because they didn't want to work and stealing things. And it's just part of the fear mongering that they're doing. They're just, it's just it. They're just keeping us down. We have to rise above it, figure out how we can help each other out as a community. If you have some, give it away and give it to somebody who doesn't and then help them up and bring them to the fight. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. We haven't heard from Vicky in a while either. Is she still on? She, she comes in and out. Vicky, did you want to uh, respond to that or any of the other points we've talked about? And then we, I have three people on the stack. And I see you, brother, with your hand raised. Um, I don't think she's on right now. So this is actually okay. a question for, for Rukia. And uh, it comes from Steve Miller. And he says, uh, can you please explain how the communities in Jackson play a role in local governance? And then we'll go to the gentleman who has his hand raised. Yeah, I'll be real quick. So we utilize people's assemblies, the format of people's assemblies. Um, and so we use it as a, a means for people led governance. So the example I love to give is when my father would walk into a people's assembly, he would present an issue um, or a proposal that was before city council and he would say, how should I vote? And so the people would then um, vet that and then indicate how they felt he should walk into the room and move using a consensus process. So we use assemblies and anybody who's interested, I'm happy, 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 happy to talk more about that. Um, I'll put my information in the chat. Wonderful, thank you. I'm sorry, Lisa, I apologize. Lisa de Santiago, um, uh, Lou just corrected me. Did, did you want to ask a question? Um, this, is, this, this is Vicky. If it's too echoey, maybe you can chat no, your response. I think I just disappeared. Oh, that's better now. Clear? So I just want to comment on a couple of things. We all speak together. Sorry, Lisa. I guess uh, Vicky's going to speak. OK. Or not. OK, Lisa, go ahead. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> Right. It's all right. I love it and I hate it. Uh, so I, I'm an educator. I come from that field. And there's a couple of things. It's, all these questions are really tied together. Um, I remember doing a, a piece where we talked about, and it was just recently because I was at University for Peace in Costa Rica, and we were talking about COVID and the need of water and basic needs that aren't being given to different people and why that happens. So when you put together, when you talk about uh, health care, you talk about education, you talk about housing, water, those are basic needs. And as Andrea said, they should not be commodities, right? Why do I pay my taxes? And the paper that we, we did as a group was looking at the Navajo Nation and how their lack of water uh, really affects the uptick of COVID infections in that part. So when I share, and this is what I say as an educator, the narrative, the question is always who controls the narrative, the people in power. But we can control the, the narrative if we do it together. Andrea, as you said, they love to divide and conquer us. The narrative for me, a very strong way to bring it together is you need to take the message, this wonderful, powerful, hopeful, positive message that you all are speaking. You need to take it to the youth, right? Because I can't make an adult recycle, right? We can make laws, we can do all we want. And the adult says, it's my right in America, right? We always say that. It's my right to not to do that, right? But if their kid comes home and says, mom, dad, this is what I learned, that, 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 all of a sudden, those same parents got three buckets set up for their recycling. So talk to the kids, bring it to your youth programs that are there. You will find allies, not only in those, those kids, but you'll find it in their parents because the message gets taken upward. Everyone that I discussed the Navajo Nation situation with, when I told them that what they get for water, for everything, for their family, for their crops, for everything, for bathing, is what we use by flushing the toilet six times in a day. Right? Everybody goes, whoa, whoa. And that's everything for them. And part of what happened was when America went across the nation with their infrastructure, they decided to take a bypass past the Navajo Nation. They had it there to put it in, but they decided that Navajos weren't worthy of them having infrastructure built in for their water, not for their roads. So we know that they go after the marginalized people. And I won't call myself another in any other way. I don't like that word, 
I'm Puerto Rican, so if you want to see a little bit of what happened, the hurricane hit, he threw us paper towels, but he didn't know that an electrical grid went down that still isn't functional. The water was filthy. People were drinking water coming out of like nuclear plants because it was clear, it wasn't clean, right? Uh, their educational system, they are putting so little money back into the rebuilding of those schools because I forget who said it, it might've been you again, Andrea, you, you really inspired me, I hear you, um, is they want to control the kids so that the only choice, when I work with my Latinx teens, my guys all wanna be cops or military because that seems to be the only job that they can have that gives them some sort of power. And if not there, the other option in the urban areas is gangs, because that gives me power. Again, a way to divide us. So that's just what I wanted to say about how that's all wrapped up. And if we can control the narrative, speaking among ourselves, but take the time to speak to your kids, your grandkids, right? Take the time if you can. And Callie, I'm in your neck of the woods in Chicago. If you wanna know about some organizations that would love to see you, you come in and talk about water because they're right on the lake, I can help you out with that. So that's what I got to say, and, and thank you for listening, y'all. That's awesome, Lisa, and that's the kind of connection we hope to to foster through these talks, right? That's beautiful. Vicki, um, I'm sorry, you were echoing a lot, and, and Lisa was speaking. You want to try and give it a, a go? You're muted, too. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Whoa. I, back to speaker volume. I just muted you, Vicky. I think it might be because your phone is also on. You can maybe leave the meeting from your mobile device and then we might not get the echo from your uh, your app device. Right. Thanks, Adam. And headphones might help too. Um, so while she gets that sorted out, Jim, do you want to ask your question? Do you leave? Jim had a question. Um, oh my gosh, sorry. I, I Jim may have left, but uh, ah, I gotta scroll up. Sorry, sorry. He wanted to know. Oh, what is the significance that water is now a commodity traded on the stock exchange? It's a great question. I mean. <laughs> Anytime anything gets traded on the commodity, it's an, I mean, we, everything comes from the earth. Everything that we have comes from the earth. Um, and, and it's and the earth is stripped from those things that whatever it is that that made, but to put water, water, water is really supposed to be a public trust. It has been for most of um, humankind. Like we would not have made it this far as a species had we not all of us felt some sort of responsibility to the water that we drank, that we bathed in, that we took care of our babies in. So it's hard to think about that in a capitalist system. What does it look like for people to actually steward the water and actually think of it, right? But we're at a moment where we have no choice but to think about what that looks like. Um, we can no longer even accept privatization or global trading of water. So what does that look like? Think about it. Water um, being uh, bottled here and sold all over the world, right? Well, how are we supposed to be stewards of something that is being bottled here and sold all over the world. Water should be free for everyone. I know that um, people have stated that here, it should be free for everyone, then everybody is gonna feel their own res responsibility to the local water and the water that they use. Privatizing it or um, selling it as a commodity I'm pretty sure that there's no worse, I, I'm not a religious person, I, it's sin for the lack of a better, no worse destructive behavior um, on the planet. I, I can't even, uh, to me, that's, we, we have, we are at a cross point where if we don't figure out 
how to make water a public trust as a sacred living being public trust. We failed our kids. We failed our grandkids and every generation after us. And, um, and we get what the planet gives us after that. Yeah, I think, no, I, I agree. I think about that a lot. Not just because I have small kids, but mm -hmm. you know, what are we fighting for if not for for our children? You know, I mean, it's, it's yeah. I think a, um, it's, go ahead. a lot of the problem with our capitalist society is things don't have um, any value until it's killed and sold, and I think that's what's sad part. Like um, the trees, all right, they can grow in the forest until we need that land, until we need a Christmas tree, until we want new furniture, until we want toothpicks. Then it becomes valuable and they go chop it down and make, make, make things out of it and sell it. Whereas it, that tree was happy living in the forest, communicating with the other trees. Um, the water, same thing. The water is going along, along its stream, happy as can be, providing life and sustenance as it should until we divert it and change it and make it into what we want it to be. And I think that's where our biggest issue is, is that in this world, nothing has value until it's killed and able to be sold. And can I say one more thing about the, um, of course. Lisa had spoke under the Lisa name about um, black and Latino people and wanting to be policemen and military. They're targeted. When I lived in Southwest Detroit, we had festivals and events all the time, and the police were always there, and so was the army. They had army, um, like, trying to canvass you in high school to join and sign up. When I lived in other areas that were um, better financially, they don't have that. They are targeting um, Black people and people of color to, to bring up their weapons and fight for them. That's why they're, do you want to get out of here? Well, then you have to fight. And then they get maimed, hurt, injured, and who takes care of them? Not the VA. I know so many people that are hurting now and in pain from different things that they did when they're in, in the armed services, protecting. In my in my world, it's not our land anymore. Well, it is, but you know they're saying we're doing land acknowledgments from the stolen lands, but our people are still protecting those lands. In our minds, those weren't stolen. We're still fighting every day for those, and. That's where we're at with that. But those, our people are being targeted to fight in these militaries for them, to protect them, to go against their own people when they're uh, fighting in pipelines. And they're going to send our people in there to fight us and do that. You know, to, I keep picturing um, Standing Rock when I saw all those lines of police cars standing there and the rubber bullets and the water tanks and cannons and all of that at the people who were praying for the water and trying to stop this. And remember, Bismarck said they didn't want it. So they diverted it through the um, dapple through the, to, through the reservation who didn't want it either and went through our cemeteries. So it's a, it's a big mess, but really we just got to fight it. Every step we get, I fight it up every day and say, who am I going to mess up today? And try and get at least three people in or corporations. And that's where we're at with it. And I really wish Vicki were on here because I really wanted to learn more about um, Flint and what's happening. Her and I have talked on Facebook before. And I'm really, really just want you to know, Vicki, you're missed because I really wanted to hear what you had to say. Yeah, let's try. I'm missing you. <laughs> let's try one more time to hear from Vicki. So, um, her audio is still connecting, Adam. From the app, but on the phone, if you can hit star six and unmute, um, let's try try that because you're 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 on the call from your mobile device on, and at the same time you're joining the call from the app or from an internet browser. So um, on the mobile, if you hit star six or if you have an unmute button, um, we can try that out, and then we can always remove one of the two devices for you once one starts working. True. But it's true, the app is now not connected to audio, it says. So I don't know. Okay. I think you're good, Vicky. Go you ahead. You there, Vicky? She's there. She said she's unmuted, but 
Yeah. Hmm. Vicky, try it. Try a set of heads, uh, headphones if you can't plug into your computer to see if that gives it sound. Because you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. It's actually not connected to audio yet. No. Oh, now she's trying again. All right. Well, well, Vicky's getting on. If you want to um, post some, there's some great comments. Um, and this time I didn't read the comments because I wanted all the speakers to to engage. But uh, Peter says that we will win when, when because we organize to take the political power to achieve our aims or the grandchildren and take it away from the hedge funds and their governments. The abolitionists did it, so can we. Yeah. Oh, power. Like, Vicky, do you want to, um, can, can you uh, see if we can hear you now? Still not connected to audio, it looks like. Oh, what a shame. Next time we do in this, we send in a tech person over for Vicky. Right. <laughs> yeah. I know there's, I got friends in, in Flint. <laughs> we'll up there and help. Yeah, for real. Yeah. No, I'm serious. No, but, I think so. Especially now. Totally. Yeah. Do we have Claire. I, I thought, I thought I saw Claire McClinton was on the call earlier. I did see Claire. Claire yeah, is I still on the call and, and Claire is, is, is from Flint. Um, if, if you want to, um, Bless us with your wisdom, Claire. Uh, no pressure, but um, just just to respond to any any of these uh, uh, questions or um, any any sort of comment. And and we'd love to um, hear from other other people too uh, as well on on this question of um, how how the water struggle is interconnected with you know other struggles and and who who if we have a, a common enemy with all of them you know like I think about um, what what Jackson Mississippi was facing like what Ricky was saying they it doesn't normally get that cold there right like the the winter storm that they were hit with, the two winter storms they were hit with, were extremely un unusual, uh, right? And and of course they they say that you can't pin one weather event on on climate change or the climate crisis, and of course that's true. But that this is definitely becoming a pattern, right? And so I, I definitely see that um, um, the climate crisis will continue to to bring on these, these um, extreme weather events and further erode the already fragile infrastructure that, that these, com these vulnerable communities have been living with. And so it just goes to show you how, how all of our struggles to stop the, the climate crisis and to fund our, you know, adequately fund our communities and for human rights, they're all connected and they're all in the same struggle. Um, Anyone else want to, um, you know, speak to speak to other struggles um, or uh, or anything else right now at this point? This is Lou. <clears throat> yep, go for it, Lou. I just want to highlight a couple things that are in the chat because I think they're important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a couple things that uh, Rukia said, uh, for example. Um, one of the things earlier on was with water as a commodity, what else may become a commodity? And she asks air. And that's a serious question. It's not a joke. It's just, it is a serious question. <clears throat> uh, so I think that's important. I just wanted to highlight that. And the other thing I wanted to point out is something also that Rukia said that we have to scale it up even in Jackson. And they're doing a hell of a job in Jackson, but she says we have to scale it up. Even in Jackson, we're trying, but nowhere near where we need to be. And of course, that's that's true everywhere. But links like this that we're making today are the beginnings of, of scaling it up on a national scale. So I think that's important to consider. And the last thing I want to highlight is one of the things that uh, <clears throat> Kathy Talbot from Southern Illinois said. She was commenting on the question of the... Um, of the military and how the, she said the military and the police target our schools here too in Southern Illinois, which are primarily white because they have no jobs future. 
My daughters were even targeted after high school. We are part of the Rust Belt areas where industry has left devastation behind. Our water is poisoned by the coal industry. Our air is poisoned. We live downwind from a Veolia incinerator that burns toxic Monsanto waste. We have the highest childhood cancer rate in the nation. This affects more of us. <clears throat> um, and, and so I, I, I think that these are, you know, like Patrick was saying, all interconnected and, uh, um, I think, um, as, as Peter says, every front of struggle ends up fighting the government that represents the hedge funds and other global corporations. We have to face them together. And I think this, the people on this call represent that. So thank you. Definitely. And I think Vicky's back. Vicki, are you? Yeah. Here? Awesome. Wonderful. I've kind of lost track of where we're at. <laughs> so we were talking about um, the interconnectedness of, of struggles with like housing, um, you know, education. And then also, I, th I think when you were cut off, we were talking about how, how race and class plays a role in these war struggles as well. And the people have been batting out other ideas, but re really the floor is open. Well, yeah, um, I'd like to say that, um, that uh, color and economics had a big part on, on what happened here in Flint. Um, part of it was though the privatization of the KWA pipeline, which started the whole thing to begin with. Um, they'd been trying to get that pipeline going um, Jeff Wright, who is our Genesee County Drain Commissioner, is also the CEO of the KWA pipeline. And that pipeline is piping raw water from Lake Huron to Genesee County before it's being treated. What do they need all that raw water between Port Huron and Genesee County for? Fracking? Um, mm -hmm. Irrigation? Uh, business it wasn't to lower the water prices for the residents of flint because the residents of flint we're now we're back on detroit water um but we are still paying bonds to the kwa that were written illegally um by the the governor's approval and the state treasurer at the time who was a democrat andy Dillon. They cooked up a scheme because Flint didn't have the money to buy into the KWA pipeline. So they cooked up a scheme where they got bonds and Wells Fargo and a bunch of other big banks bought those bonds. We're paying for water we're not even using. And people, I don't think people in Flint really realize that. Um, but it's that it's a big part of the privatization of the water that's going on. Um, and it's something we've been after the attorney general to investigate because they, these people should be charged for Ill, illegal bonds and for the price that we're paying for water. The price we're paying for water isn't for the water, it's to pay back these bonds. And as long as as long as they keep keep um, allowing this to happen, people are never going to be able to recover. People are leaving Flint, walking away from their homes because their water bills are higher than what the price of their home is worth. They're and they're I'm paying water bills every month, and I use the water to flush my toilet and do a, a load of laundry every 10 days. Most of my water comes from filtered rainwater that's filtered through Berkey filters. That's what I drink, wash my face, feed my pets, my birds, um, everything with. Um, but I'm still paying those high water rates. And, as, as, and until people realize what's really going on, 
it's not going to change. It, it's going to take the people to open their eyes to get mad about it enough to do something to change it. All right, thank you. Um, Lou uh, wants to uh, lose on stack, Lou? Yeah, I, I just wanted to recognize uh, one of the people who's uh, in on the uh, call who hasn't said anything yet and hasn't put anything in chat, but her name is Sandy Reed. She's an editor of the People's Tribune and they had a wonderful uh, uh, webinar the other night on, on water rights and indigenous rights. And I wanted to see whether she had anything she wanted to add to the, okay. to the conversation. Well, I would just say that um, you know, we have a water group in the with the People's Tribune and it involves people in a lot of small communities across the country. This thing is so big. There's just people all over the place that are struggling with the same thing. And one of the things that we're trying to do is reach out to them and give them a place where they can speak. And hopefully we can, you know, play a role in helping to build a movement that can really do all the things that we're talking about here today that can get this water and can get this control from the corporations, stop the pipelines, get food for people, get housing for people. But the, the place to start really is to to begin bringing people together and having this conversation like we're doing today and really reaching out to a lot of the, um, these struggles and especially in these small smaller communities where people really feel like they're just fighting on their own and don't realize that there is, there's people everywhere. And one of the things that people in our group do is help one another. Um, we go to different People go to some of these different struggles and lend the support and then they come to their struggle. So I guess that would be the main thing. Thank you. Um, we have a comment by Andre says, we have to get people to run for office, good environmentalists, Native Americans and good people that care. And we'll make a, and make a, a pass good legislation all over the US. Um, and I've seen the issue of uh, political power come up. Can you speak to that? What would that look like for you, um, a party that represented us? Anybody, it doesn't just have to be the speakers. I think Claire unmuted herself. No, no, I didn't want to. Uh, I think this is an awesome uh, event and I'm, I'm learning so much. And like others have said, I'm taking notes. And Flynn is always ready to share our experience. And we have learned some hard lessons uh, in the course of our battle. And we're going on seven years. So I'll be reaching out to some of you when we do our seven year commemoration next month. Yeah, Thank I mean, I, I'm happy. Go oh, go for it, Andrea. Okay, well, I was oh. just going to say that I really, really think that everybody should consider running for an office. There's drain commissions that will help also. There's water boards. There's boards and commissions with the governor's office that we need should have people on. We won't get our voices out there if we stay at home and don't activate. We need to, I really believe that that's the way to make a lot of changes is to get us involved in this legislation, this is where we've been left out of a lot. And they're keeping us out for a reason. Our votes are being suppressed for a reason. Not because, you know, it, it's cute and fun, but it's because that's where the power is. And I think we need to be in the places of power. I really do. I think all of us should work together. If you see somebody running, get to know them, talk to them. You know, I met Dana Nussel when she was first deciding to run for a primary for attorney general. And that was when I found out she was totally against line five and wanted to try to work on shutting it down. We have a lawsuit now against line five and she's working to shut it down 47 days. So um, it works, you know, if you're out and if you're interested, 
you know, I ran for precinct delegate in my neighborhood. So I go to different meetings and that's how I, you know, started learning. I was never a very political person until 2018 when I was asked to go to convention and found out that the Native Americans in Michigan who have 12, 12 tribal federal, you know, reservations and people and um, did not have a caucus. And we have all of this information going on and all of this is happening. Nobody told us that we were being left out of this part of it. So we now have one. I have found out that in 2018 to 2020, we had six Native American caucuses come up in the United States. They're all part of the DNC now. Most of them were made because of pipelines or against pipelines, I should say, to work against that. So that says that a lot of people are noticing the same thing that I noticed, that we can make changes here. Run for something, talk to somebody into running for something, support people that are running, help out, do something. Uh, we have to get in this political arena and it's really dirty and nasty, but we still have to be in it because they make, they're make they making the decisions about us without us and they don't care what we need as long as they get their pockets lined. And I think that this, it has been proven trickle down. Where is it trickling? It isn't trickling to my pocket. I am suffering like crazy over here fighting everything, pipelines and um, help out with, um, I try to help out with Flint in the beginning and you know, try to be an advocate and help there. And I, I took water and was at St. Mary's Church passing out water for several weeks during Flint. Well, I shouldn't say several weeks, it was longer than that. Um, the place that we were at St. Mary's, we were, I, we were giving out water for the animals because people were talking about that their dogs were and cats were dying. I came home just heartbroken and crying and we started giving out water to people that they had pets. You know, what about fishes? What about the fish bowls? You know, there's just so many different ways that we need this water. We have to fight for it in every way that we can. Like I said, I used to be in the streets and, and with a megaphone leading people with cheers to bring awareness. That was what that was, bring awareness. And I gave out homework little quarter sheets of paper, call this person, call that person, tell them that you want, you don't want line five, tell them you don't want Nexus, tell them you don't want this, give reasons why. Now I'm like, we need to be more. It's not just about calling them. We need to be them. And that's, you know, seriously, we need to activate in every level. We need to still protest in the streets. We need to write letters to the editor because that's our legislators are reading those. We need to, um, write them, email our legislators. We need to be our legislators. All right, thank you. We're I here. just want to point out that uh, she left out that when she realized that there was no caucus for indigenous people, she created one. <laughs> she absolutely created one. And she's. Um, I've been in the streets of, with her for many, 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 many years. Um, it's, you know, those, when she says this, it's not coming from somebody who does it. She like creates these things and puts those things together. So uh, she's coming from real, um, uh, real human experience on them. She left out, she created it when she saw it didn't happen. I just thought everybody should know. Thank you. Uh, Rakia, did you un unmute uh, earlier? Did you have anything to add? No, I think Andrea said it all right on. I'm with it. Um, we got to no longer just march on City Hall. We have to become City Hall mm -hmm. and every government agency that is necessary for our, our liberation. Reach. And Adam, uh, you're on stack? Yes. No, absolutely. What, what an enriching conversation. Just so happy and honored to be even a part of it. And uh, all I want to add at this point is that, you know, we've seen from the conversation and the stories and the examples that are so broad and so historic and so wide ranging and encompassing of essentially all of our society nationally, internationally, globally around these life or death issues for humans and for the planet that, you know, we're dealing with a system that is in crisis, a system that is really dying in so many ways that cannot continue, that is not sustainable. What does that mean for us? It, may, it, it, it means that we're revolutionaries in a sense, not because we, you know, believe 
we are revolutionaries, but because we have no choice but to transform society. We, we have to build a new world. And so what does that mean? What does that look like? It absolutely looks like replacing the old uh, people and, and political institutions and parties with new ones, and at the same time, doing the kind of direct action you know, that, uh, you know, Rising Tide Chicago does, that the, that the you know, uh, pipeline protests have been kind of the leaders of, you know, uh, people chaining themselves to pipelines, people organizing themselves in really, you know, truly militant ways, not militant in the sense of using guns and arms and weapons, but militant in the sense of, you know, organizing for a life or death struggle, organizing to take what's ours, what we need to survive. And, and as we're doing that, we're kind of breaking this old dying system up, helping it die, while at the same time winning the battles that are that are still taking place within it as it's dying, so that we can change it to something new. As, as so, it's dying and transforming at the same time is how I see it. It's a subtle process, and so, like Kaylee said in the chat, diversity of tactics is needed, um, and. Yeah, that, that's all I, I, I really wanted to add at this point, I think. But thank you, everyone, for this. Oh, thank you, Adam. So uh, Lou uh, is on stack. And I think after Lou, we're probably going to close out. Uh, the only thing I wanted to do was to, since, I mean, I think having Rukia from Mississippi is really, really important in terms of uh, seeing the struggle that's going on there, and in particular, uh, actually being in a position of political power in a certain sense at the same time as recognizing how weak that political power is when you can't get the funds from the state and all that kind of stuff. I think that's really significant. But the other thing I want to say is we have somebody else from the South, uh, from Georgia here, who might want to give us a little, just a little taste of what it's like in terms of the uh, attempts to to assert political power in in that state, which was so pivotal in November and January. So maybe Rita, can you give us a just a, a couple of comments? Well, I I, I think I'd uh, pretty much defer to uh, Adam's wrap up. I th I think that was terrific. Um, I mean, very very briefly, we we we've been going through a major. Well, it's been going on. Uh, since the defeat of Reconstruction, you know, a major fight around uh, voter suppression in the state. And what people may not know is not only, you know, more um, uh, restrictions on absentee balloting, which was which was used historically during Jim Crow to prevent uh, uh, and suppress the black vote. It was used uh, on the white vote, and now. Uh, it, it's not only the question of absentee balloting, it is the question of taking away uh, state elected officials um, power and residing that power in the state legislature in terms of approval of anything of statewide substance, i.e. Medicaid expansion, living wage, the, the, the state of Georgia sued the mayor of Atlanta for uh, initiating a mass mandate. So this, I mean, if, if Rukia was kind of hitting on it in terms of Jackson too, is that the state will target uh, uh, the potential for any kind of transformation politically as it related to the electoral process, knowing that when Warnock and Ossoff won those elections in the Senate, that the entire way of white supremacy maintaining its power in the state of Georgia was being challenged in, a, in, in, in some real ways. And the, um, the new bill, the Senate Bill 202, which was just signed, and they just arrested uh, one of the legislators in Georgia, Park Cannon, a black woman who tried to witness the signing of that bill, that that kind of arrest, incarceration, um, and, and it really a form of terror um, 
is being used now with this new bill that would put the power in the hands of the state legislature in terms of who runs for office and the control of county election boards. The state legislature reapportions itself and it reapportions itself on the basis of maintaining their political hegemony. So statewide offices, which are now have been witnessed to be challenged, um, are, uh, are looking at the 2022 election where, you know, Stacey Abrams is likely to run against um, uh, Kemp in that election uh, to, to prevent these local election boards from certifying results that might go contrary to the existing power structure. And I know that was uh, th that was probably more than what, what, what needed to be said, but um, this vote suppression, looking at the electoral process within the context of the revolutionary motion that we're seeing around the country, these things are related to each other, um, you know, because they, they need to suppress this, the, the electoral um, efforts that are coming forward. But, I, I, you know, just, just to summarize, I think Adam said it really beautifully, as something is dying away, something is al also being built. And we're, we're fighting on so many fronts that it becomes critical to fight together uh, uh, to win these battles. And I apologize for talking too long and, and really am honored to be here. And Rakia, it's beautiful to see you, um, you know, we, we often don't get a lot of folks from the South on, on uh, you know, calls outside of the South. So uh, it, it's, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much. Oh, Rita, what you had to say was on point. Um, Rukia? Oh, you lady. I was just saying thank you. That was it. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you all. Uh, um, if there's no last few comments um, or questions, um, we're at two hours. Um, I'll pause for the pedagogical pause. No, anyone? Then. Um, Sorry. Um, I just wanted to put a face to the name. I'm so thankful to be um, part of this community. I'm from so-called Portage, Michigan, just south of Kalamazoo. And I just wanted to put a face to the name because I will be trying to connect with a lot of you. Um, just recently working with the environmental board and um, you know writing letters to city council and that. So I would love to pick your brains or have you join in in one of our um, newly established groups to do your presentation as well. So thank you all. Yeah, Mary Beth and anybody feel free to post your emails and socials. You know, um, that'd be great. Somebody also called for a database, which I think we can glean from the chat um, and send it to the participants. Why not? You know, um, sorry, Patrick, go ahead. No worries. Yeah, um, definitely. And so, yeah, we're wrapping up. We're going to send it to um, our comrade Daniel um, to uh, tell us more about Lerna and introduce our final poet. Uh, hello, everyone. Can Patrick, can, can you guys hear me all right? Perfect. Awesome. Uh, well, it's it's been a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here and, and listening in. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here with us. I'm absolutely blown away by the discussion and, and analysis that's been provided today. Um, a big shout out to our speakers and our moderators, our tech folks, participants, and, and anyone that attended and, and made this effort today. Um, as it's been mentioned, water is the only reason uh, that any living thing exists on this planet. Uh, water should not be dictated by the market or profit motives. Uh, it does not belong to the state. It does not belong to corporation. It belongs to the people and all living things on earth. Uh, it's empowering and inspirational to know that there are so many people out there, including those in our presence today, that are fighting to preserve it in order to make it accessible and drinkable for all. Um, and, and, and in addition to that, I also want to speak a little bit about the League, uh, the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, aka LERNA. Uh, so who are we? Um, we are members of the working class, uh, coming from an assortment of backgrounds and experiences. We are social, political, and class conscious individuals uh, working to elevate the consciousness of our class and to influence the struggle for change, as well as the transformation to a cooperative society. 
uh, a society that must be based on public ownership of necessities of the necessities of life, like water and the distribution of goods according to need. Uh, our mission is to connect with and to unite the scattered freedom fighters, those of us that are here today, and the demands of a growing class of workers that are not that are demanding food, quality housing, education, and health care. Uh, this is a growing class of workers that can no longer survive in a system of corporate property and endless oppression. Uh, we use study and analysis as our tools. We use education as our weapon uh, to mobilize and engage in the battles of ideas. We struggle in real time in the streets and workplaces and everywhere else that we go. Uh, the Rally Comrades publication and website provides up-to-date articles statements and analysis of the key questions and events of importance to the people, um, like many of the issues that have been discussed today. We encourage you to check us out and subscribe to the Rally Comrades at rallycomrades.org. We invite you to join us in this struggle for change, uh, to be a member is to accept the program, unite around the fight for basic needs, study and learn from one another, and most of all, realize a vision to secure the future of humanity and our planet, you can contact us at learna.org, L-R-N-A dot org, and the Learner Chicago Facebook page. Thank you all once again for coming today. We appreciate y'all. Uh, much love. The future is up to us and the masses of the people. And now we will close with our final poet, uh, Katrina Flores, a.k.a. L. La Katrina. Good job. Yeah. Very good job. Good job. All right. Katrina Brooke Flores. Hi, everyone. Hello, my name is Katrina Brooke Flores. I'm Indigenous Chicanix. My pronouns are she and they. My family is from Southern Texas and Northern Mexico. My grandparents and my father, when he was a young child, were migrant workers, which is how I came to be born in Wisconsin. I'm going to be sharing a poem that was commissioned by Her Wellness Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for an event around the issues our community faces around murdered and missing indigenous women. Her Wellness creates space for intergenerational trauma healing for our indigenous communities in Wisconsin and beyond, informed by what they call community activated medicine. And then I will share a short song called They Try and from my Dark Matter Artist and Residency Project through Elastic Arts here in Chicago, Zagagun called Seed Pollinate Bloom, a sonic and visual short film calling forward a future of thriving for Black, Indigenous, and Afro-Indigenous peoples. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this important action space and to share some words and a song. Klauso kamati wel meak mashipati ne me. Here is my poem. The missing will not go quiet. The murdered will not be silenced. She has disappeared like water rises past homelands in the Pacific, we wonder why. These men drill, they move into her without regard. Some say their humanity has been lost. There are camps of men taking blood from our earth, our mother, like her, our daughters are being murdered. Many are still missing, no milk carton carries her name. Alerts are most only often for girls named Amber with skin much lighter. Families rise up, they ask questions, no answers come, her body is covered. In the Solomon Islands, they pray as the heat rises. They wonder where their mother has gone. Her islands are disappearing. What part of her will be devoured next? In Manitoba, a mother searches for her daughter. Precious like hand-beaded mukluks, they are laid by the door waiting to be worn again. On a border of a homeland divided by governments that don't know our people's ancestral tongues in Juarez, a woman leaving work in La Ruta, a maquilladora, makes disposable goods, consume and dispose a cycle of behavior that haunts the women walking home. A trail of pink crosses offers no comfort. She is missing, but she will not be forgotten. She is murdered, but she will not stay silent. Who is stealing our sisters? Why? We can no longer walk to our waters to drink. 
We find our sisters in deserts or by the river, bloated beyond belief like padded wallets that keep secret the interests they don't want us to hold accountable. The institutions have caused historical trauma and they are not human. This form of masculinity turned murder is not sacred. There is a better way. The people will prevail. The songs will carry us. Closer to reclaiming everything we've lost, we will find them, our bodies of water are sacred. Our stories of survival are sacred. Our ways will not disappear. We will not go silent. We will not be forgotten. We are a strong people. We will say our sisters' names so they can find their ways home. We are rich people in culture and stories. We will remember the sounds of their laughter and carry those good memories with us. We are a healing people. We will use our ancestors' medicine, respect our existence or expect our resistance. Our sisters, our nieces, our aunties, our daughters will be remembered. They will live in us as our mother, our earth will live. We claim it now, we claim it every day until it is this way. I imagine a circle of women, all here now in flesh and spirit, Together with our mother, we rise, ready to do the work, ready to love each other through these times. We will eat together. We will share a dance. We will talk and laugh together. And our daughters, daughters, great granddaughters will share stories of how we turn survive back into thrive for our people. Thank you. Klaso Komatli. Okay, so now I'm gonna share um, and end with a song. Um, it's called Day Trying. Like I said, it's from a short film I did for an artist residency I'm currently in, in Chicago at Elastic Arts called Dark Matter Residency from the film project I wrote called Seed Pollinate Bloom. And this is the song. This is my baby. <laughs> I'm a new mama. She's this so is, chill. This is, oh. you know. <laughs> Uh, so um, this song is called They Trying, and this is the way I'd like to close this out, and here we go. They try, they try, they trying to bury me. They try, they try, they trying to bury me. They didn't know I am a seed. They didn't know we are the seeds rooted in the land. We take a stand, rooted in the land. We take a stand, rooted in the land. We take a stand, ancestors with us like the water. We are the water. Want you to know how beautiful our daughters rise, our sunshine, our daughters rise. Our sunshine, our children on the line, but ancestors with us like the water. We are the water, rooted in the land. We take a stand, we raise our hands, we take the stand, cultivating. Cultivating with my pain. We raise our hands, we take a stand, a global plan, a global plan. Just take my hand, just take a stand, just take a hand. Yeah, it's a global plan. Thank you, Miigwech. Yes. Oh, thank you, Katrina. What a great way to close the program. Beautiful. Appreciate you, Katrina. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Happy full moon. Get up, stand up. Stand up for your right. Get up, stand up. Don't give up the fight. Get up, stand up, stand up for your rights. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. And we say water is life. We face the same genocide. We pray we will survive. We 
say we won't go quiet We say water is life We face the same genocide We pray we will survive We say we won't go quiet